This is our second out of 12 videos that we're going to be shooting on site on four different live ADU projects. And this one, this is a big one. I'm out of my depth here. So Yasser, what are we looking at? This is a corner lot in West Hamilton. We are basically a block from a post-secondary institution, Mohawk College. We have two units that are already legal and the bungalow behind us that are already generating income. But this here, this is hunting. If you guys can work with your power team, go out and identify properties where this is possible. I think this is where you get the maximum value. Welcome back to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. I'm Adam J.D. Martin, your host, and I'm back with Yasser from Triple Five Construction. This is our second out of 12 videos that we're gonna be shooting on site on four different live ADU projects. And this one, this is a big one. I'm out of my depth here. So Yasser, what are we looking at? Yeah, you might think that this is a single family home behind us, but it's actually an accessory dwelling unit, which is essentially a garden suite, a granny flat, laneway homes. You've heard lots of these street terms, but the technical term are accessory dwelling units, which is what you see here. So just to give you a little bit of the landscape of this project or this property, this is a corner lot in West Hamilton. We are basically a block from a post-secondary institution, Mohawk College. We have two units that are already legal and the bungalow behind us that are already generating income. Now, what we have here is not a garage retrofit, like the entry level one that we did in a previous episode. In this one, we actually have a net new garden suite from the ground up, full excavation, full foundation, all the way through. And then from the planning side of things, we have one more thing that we'll sprinkle in a little bit later about the basement here. Yeah, I'm really excited to unpack this project because it's totally different than the one that we looked at in the previous video. In the previous video, we unpacked a project where there was an existing garage in the backyard and we took what looked like a super average lot with a with you know a super average garage and we added a whole new unit that was able to be implemented in about you know in six figures and we were able to look at what could add about seventeen hundred dollars of rent to you know an average building in an average lot now we have this big project that you know i'm really excited about but looking around this neighborhood it kind of looks to be another average neighborhood and another relatively average lot and this is where I'm getting really excited because these big value adds looks to be that they can be found anywhere. And having that post-secondary um, institution right there and having a neighborhood like this, where like, if you look around this neighborhood, I can see right across the street, another opportunity to do this type of project. Right beside that property, there's another opportunity to do this type of project. And just looking around here, I know we talked about the power team in the last video. I think it's coming really to light here that like, if you're working with the right team, you can find these opportunities all over the place. And I know the market's kind of heating up now and there's some more inventory coming. And I'm really excited for you guys to be able to watch these videos, actually get some knowledge out of here and understand how you could put into practice one of these projects. So let's take a look. All right, so we just climbed up into this brand new structure and I'm hoping to get a walkthrough because I'm looking at a lot of framing and I want you guys to really understand the layout of this structure and what type of value we're adding here by building from brand new. Yeah, so let's fast forward through the planning side, which we'll touch on another video. Uh, quick construction breakdown or spec sheet, if you will. We're kind of standing in the open living room, kitchen, laundry area. It's approximately 600 square feet in this unit. As I'm working my way to the bathroom, you got your vanity, your tub, your toilet, and then we have our two, you know, fairly decent sized bedrooms in the back of this unit. And then what we do to kind of make a space feel bigger than it is, because like I said, it's approximately 600 square feet, which is kind of the sweet spot of where you need to be to get two legal bedrooms, which is always great for ROI for rental income. We've kind of created these tall walls, almost 10 feet here to make it feel more grand. And then if you see all these windows and even the doors built in with transoms to get tons of natural light in here, all those are major added value from a construction standpoint. Um, beyond that, some of the specs that we kind of force out in units, no matter how small or how big they are, uh, laundry is an important one for us. Dishwasher is important for us. If we can get parking outside, of course we'll create it. Doesn't always work out that way. This place happens to have all the above. 
When you combine that with our finishing abilities, I think that we'll get top rent over here. Yeah, I think what's really important to note about this unit is this 600 square feet feels like 1200 square feet in the way that it's designed. And that's the beauty compared to our last video where we looked at a smaller unit that was inside an existing envelope, inside an existing structure. This was planned from the ground up. So everything in here makes perfect sense in terms of layout, in terms of the sizing and spacing of everything, the lighting considerations, just these high ceilings. This is a gorgeous space. Like I know it's really hard for you guys to see on the camera, but that's a huge bathroom. Like I think that's about a 30 inch vanity going in there. We've got a shower tub combo, which uh, can invite kids or young families. We've got a great planning space there for the toilet. It's not feeling cramped. The kitchen, it's huge, right? And the way that we have built in a window there, we're gonna have tons of lighting in there. The bedrooms, you're getting at least a queen bed in there. And I find that's really hard for me to do in my existing portfolio. Like I've done a lot of projects on older buildings where it's really difficult to make 600 square feet feel nice. It's really hard to get the buildings outside and their exterior to look nice. And it's hard to get the inside to feel nice. And what this says to me is a high quality tenant. This is gonna be an A plus tenant in here in a beautiful neighborhood, right? We're just minutes away from a college. So you could do students if you really wanted. You could do a young family here. This neighborhood is beautifully set up. Somebody can have parking in this unit too. Like this is the perfect case, the best case scenario to add value. And again, I liken this to sort of the difference between hunting and farming in your portfolio. Because the farming element is when you're going and you're touching up those old units, which you need to continue doing, right? You need to add the dishwasher. You need to add the laundry, touch up the paint, maybe the floor, even the kitchen cabinets as you get those turnovers. But this here, this is hunting. If you guys can work with your power team, go out and identify properties where this is possible. I think this is where you get the maximum value. And we're thinking about appraised value. We're thinking about how to get these financed. We're thinking about what sort of design and layout can we do where we're actually going to get that tenant quality that we're looking for. Yeah. This is A+. Plus. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, just to go back to kind of the, you know, layer in the investment conversation as you were, Adam, it's not always about acquisition. It's not always about your existing law, but we can talk about both when you're looking at expansion, right? Like the province is really pushing for additional units on property. So you can basically get three or four units, depending on the city that you're in, um, for residential expansion. And this is what we're doing is densifying, right? So there's two units in the existing bungalow or whatever structure that you have there. And then we're expanding in, in the rear lot via either a garage conversion, like we've done in another video, or where we control the construction like this uh, scenario with new construction. And we can create it whatever way that the lot allows us to, but to maximize the ROI. The beautiful thing about these structures is the banks are finally starting to be on board, which is a very, very important part from an investment standpoint. They want to look at kind of what the future value is or the ARV is. So you can kind of get that refinance and kind of you know, keep keep working and evolving within your portfolio. We've seen Equitable Bank come out now with um, an ARV kind of formula where you're getting uh, full construction costs plus 20% back. Okay, yeah. that's just one bank. If we start to see the five or six big banks involved in this process, then I think it's a big year for 2025 when you're talking about these small scale conversions. Yeah, and I think too, like this is really the future of investing when it comes to massive value add. The way that we've seen volume moving, the way that we've seen inventory, the way that we've seen the stickiness in the market after COVID, this is the way that we find value, right? We go out, we hunt that you might have a property already in your portfolio that fits these specs. This is another property like the last one that looks like a normal property. It's just a house, it's just a duplex that happened to have a fairly sizable yard. But I mean, just looking at it, this might be a 100 foot yacht lot, maybe 125. Mm -hmm. It's not huge. This is not a 300 foot Standard. lot. It's just not. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you guys too should be considering what do you have in your existing portfolio that you could be adding value to? Because people are always talking acquisitions, but we're never really looking already at what we have, right? And there's so much in there's so much inefficiency in our portfolios. And I speak for every investor when I say that because I know it. Um, 
that this is a great place to start looking. Yeah, we like to use a term called scaling sideways. I don't know if you guys have heard of that term, but it, it became more prominent during post-COVID. Post-COVID knocked a lot of people out of the market. It yep. really put the fear into the investor world, uh, the real estate community in Ontario. Maybe it should have. Maybe we were maybe we were spoiled for a long time, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, this is where we are now. So maybe you're scaling sideways, which means you're densifying or expanding or intensifying lots or projects or assets that you already have. Maybe it's not always about um, acquisition. And even on the acquisition side, you have to factor in kind of all the plan that goes in that with the 20% down, dealing with your realtor and your mortgage broker and you know uh, land transfer tax and capital gains on the back end, all that kind of stuff. But when you have a project like this, it's planning in a different way, right? It's kind of doing your zoning, your bylaw, your building code assessments, getting your budget for a project like this, and then seeing what the ARV is on the back end of that. So the end result will look the same optically to you, but uh, the approach and the mindset is fairly different. Yeah, and we're actually going to do a whole video where we unpack the planning process from doing those additional dwelling units in the back of the lot where it's, it's a retrofit, like a garage or a shed, and then we're gonna be also talking about the planning of a project where it's from the ground up. Because I know if you already have that scarcity mindset, if you're already scared about entering the market, you're gonna be terrified about building one of these from the ground up. Yeah. But that's why we have Triple Five. I mean, that's why we brought them to the channel to help talk about what those challenges are and what opportunities we actually have. Because at the end of the day, we're here to talk about problems or profits, right? So we wanna do a whole video on that, just unpacking that so you guys really understand where you should be scared, right? Because there are scary elements about new projects like this and where you just need to lean on your power team. And so I'm really looking, on, looking forward to unpacking that with you guys in a future video. Today, we're gonna go outside right now. We're gonna talk about the numbers. Okay, as promised, Yasser, we gotta talk about the numbers because in our last video, we discussed that retrofit, that garage, that shed additional unit. This is a brand new build. And this is where I start to really get out of my depth in terms of understanding like, how long is this taken to get to this point? How long is it going to go from start to finish? And roughly, what does it cost? Yeah, so that's always the elephant in the room, right? If people want to know how much they have to spend. So that's what our team does, right? We kind of create these proposals much before you actually get into a project so that you're able to digest planning and the pricing of planning and just i'll take a quick pause there when i'm saying planning i don't mean it rhetorically i mean it technically right there's zoning checks there's bylaw checks you're going to be creating some paperwork something to hand to the municipality to say this is my proposed layout this is what i'm building give me a permit that's what i'm referencing by planning right so you're taking that there's obviously a cost associated with that and then obviously the cost for construction and to build it along with all of its services. So we did look at another project with our team in the retrofit ADU. We reference those projects start at about the six figure range. Uh, we'll be transparent with this kind of project. You start to get into the 200s of thousands, right? But everything comes back to numbers, right? So for spending that kind of money on a project like this, what are our returns? What's the rate of return? Are we getting the ROI that we're looking for? Well, because the area that we're in, the location in West Hamilton, we're looking to generate about $2,300 in rent a month. That's what our client will be chasing. Hopefully they get it. And if that's the case, that's somewhere around $27,000 a year. If my math is, is decent. So another quick math in my head it tells me about eight years to pay it off. So if it takes eight years to pay it off, your ninth year, you're fully cash flow on this unit, and then the one factor that we haven't talked about is the appraised value, the forced equity that we've put into this property and that a bank will recognize. We talked about Equitable Bank recognizing these projects now, ADUs, and then definitely the five or six banks got to be talking about it. And hopefully we see something in 2025 for them. So once the landscape kind of changes for that part of the investment, then I, you know, it makes these small scale investments so worth it in the end. Yeah, so from what it sounds like from where I'm standing, if we add about $200,000, right, plus or minus, we're at around that $200,000 mark, we're getting $2,300 in rent. Guys, that's hitting our ancient, our allegedly extinct 1% rule, right? We're starting to get into that territory. We're adding units like that and adding that type of revenue makes a ton of sense. Because again, we're adding the services, we're adding a brand new structure. There's gonna be no deferred maintenance here. Right? There's gonna be no old furnace, there's gonna be no old roof, there's gonna be none of those things that add cost 
to our old retrofits. And instead, we're building this brand new, beautiful unit that's new inventory for the market that they value at the highest, right? So this is where we get those A-plus tenants. So it's not just the 2300, it's 2300 and an A-plus tenant. And I think that's really important to conceptualize as well. How long is this project going to take? It's, I'll go over the planning and the construction, yep. but one more thing, Adam, is 2300 plus A plus tenants plus utilities. That's because right. it's new construction, we're getting an independent gas meter through Enbridge, so that'll be offset. We have the own uh, meter service going in there for hydro, so there'll be three on this property because it's three units, so it'll be independent there. And we're actually doing a sub-meter for the water reading as well. Really? So it's plus, plus, plus. So these projects bring back so much value. But to bring it back down to timelines, very important whether it's acquisition or already an existing asset in your portfolio, it does matter because these things do take time. We like to be transparent with our timelines. Yep. So our planning, once again, our formal planning, can take anywhere between two to three months, eight to 12 weeks, right? We're coming up in December now, right? Holidays are obviously gonna impact it. So once we get the permit to build, then we get into the construction timelines, which depending on the size of a project from a general standpoint, anywhere between three to six months. This one, because of the size of it, as you can see, it's quite the project. It's closer to the five, six month range. So you take those two timelines, add them up. So you got the planning, the construction, you're looking at about nine months for a project. Perfect. And some of that planning, of course, like we mentioned in the last video, can be done while your actual property is under contract, right? So once we're sure we're going to be buying the property, we can start that planning process and actually start having the drawings, having the permits applied for, and all those things that we need to do in terms of um, getting it right with the city. And then on day one, we can start actually preparing the site for construction. So that's really exciting man that's not that that's not that long especially when you consider we have tenants uh in a lot of these buildings right we're adding a building to the back of an existing structure if that structure is rented you know a lot of your carry costs a lot of those challenges that you would face if you were to try and rip down a whole new building and build a brand new house with no other structure on the lot you're getting those covered. So I'm really loving the numbers here. Yeah, it's really important. Um, if, if tenants are carrying us throughout the project, I think it's a big bonus. Um, you're not carrying kind of the debt load of the actual property itself. Plus the ADU, it's kind of uh, subsidized in a way when you're talking about that. And then one more item from our why our planning is so important is the part that we're in in Hamilton or the ward that we're in is a landlord licensing ward, which does mean that you need to have a legal um, and safe and building code compliant unit in order to rent out your space. Yeah. So that's what we're hitting here as well. Yeah, so it sounds like this is the type of project where it's really all about the risk and reward, right? We're looking at a longer project line, like it's gonna take longer, it's gonna take more cash, but you're gonna get that reward. And again, when we do it right, using the right power team like Triple Five, they're gonna do that planning for you. They're gonna do everything except, <laughs> how'd you put it? He just told me off camera here, we're gonna do everything except sign the paperwork for you, which is fantastic, right? That's exactly what we wanna see from a full service um, business like Triple Five. And we want it done right so that you don't run into those permitting problems or issues with the city later. All right, so speaking of done right and making sure everything's good with the city, I actually wanted to show you guys at home the services and what that actually looks like. Because we get a lot of comments about splitting services, whether it's worth it or not on existing structures. And I'd love to just hear your opinion, your point of view on it. When it comes to building these new structures, should we be doing? And it, it sounds like on this one, it made sense. So let's just talk about what that looked like. How long does that take? What sort of cost? And you know, give us a walkthrough. Yeah, so it's it's kind of all incorporated into our business model. We already assume that we have to take this approach with services. Most municipalities want you tying back to the principal dwelling, so that's the main house on the lot. And then logistically, that's up to the construction team and how to get the services there as easily and as cost effective as possible. So if we take a walk over the services, we can chat a little more over there. Cool. Yeah, let's go look. All right, so we just walked around the front of the building and I'm actually just trying to get an idea here of what separating the services looks like from both a cost perspective, but also a timeline perspective. Because I know we get a lot of questions on the channel and you're probably thinking about it at home, right? Like how long is this gonna take? What's the process here in dealing with my tenants if I do have a tenanted building? And really like, what do I need to make it all come together? 
For sure. Um, I'll go into like the actual services and then we'll talk about how the costs are incorporated. And then the tenants is a super important sensitive factor that you should definitely uh, keep in mind when doing a project like this. So as you can see behind me, uh, we have a two gang service because this is a legal bungalow in Hamilton. We are in mid construction. So by the time we're done, you will see the three gang service here. Third service being for the ADU, of course. Uh, you'll see our trenching here has already been completed all the way to the ADU in the back. So we have it stubbed out waiting for us. Our clean out for our sewer line that's come from the principal dwelling. Okay, so I want to pause for a second. Your services come from the principal dwelling when you're doing accessory dwelling units. Okay, you're not getting a new wire ran to the hydro. You're not getting a new sewer line coming in. You're not getting a new water supply line coming in from the infrastructure of the municipality. It all comes from the principal dwelling okay so those four services the power the sewer line our water line and then gas if you choose to put gas in the unit or not at this project we are so those four are coming from the principal dwelling and then we will sub meter them so that the landlord can know what each tenant is going to pay from a utility standpoint. Now, the cost of construction for these services, they're actually already incorporated into our formula. So the pricing that we talked about a few minutes ago, that's already embedded in there because our team is for thinking the sense of you have to do this. So we'll already incorporate it in our model. And the last piece is tenant logistics. OK, want to be really sensitive as sometimes we have to have some sort of disruption with our tenants that are in the building. That is something that we provide service for, for our um, clients in the sense of we really bring the management piece to the construction side and handling this. Like just picture if you get a water disruption notice, uh, a power disruption notice, those are the things most people don't want to deal with but it's part of the project life. They are for short periods of time. The project itself, you know, can take six to nine months depending on the size of the project, but the disruption itself is short lived if your management is is, is A plus. And if you have it planned out properly, exactly. I assume too. Could you just walk us through for a second? Like, why does it matter that it's not new lines, new stuff from the municipality? Like what, what's the importance of having it come from the existing structure? Well, aside from building code and bylaw, which is driving us to do it this way, but even if you try to think of it objectively from a municipality, let's use sewer line as an example. Let's say every other house or every house did an accessory dwelling units running a sewer line to the road services, like the infrastructure would be very vulnerable at that point. So from that standpoint, uh, the municipality would definitely not allow that. We're hearing rumors that they might shift to that model, but I think it's just a rumor. Then beyond that, it comes down to the severance conversation too. If the services are tied to the principal dwelling, that'll always be part of that original dwelling, which that is the case for an accessory dwelling unit. It's not a new lot or a recognized deed, right? It's still part of the existing law. We're just expanding and adding more housing units to that law. So the services will always be back to the main one. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point to bring up, right? Like we're not severing lots here, right? And, and so I think if this is your first time thinking about doing an ADU, you might be thinking, man, I got to find two lots together, yeah. or I need to find a way to sever this or somehow work that out with the municipality. But that's not the goal, right? The goal is actually density. So we're trying to add these to the existing plots that we have, add them to the same utilities and services that are here. And in that way too, when we go to get this reappraised, we're now appraising this property as a triplex instead of a duplex, right? So it's actually as one. It's not um, a complicated situation where there's two separate buildings trying to be evaluated now. They actually view it as another unit that's new with this building, which is helpful for financing in the future and, and really helps get that valuation up for us. The last thing we'll comment on with these services that are going in to the unit when you're looking at a net new structure versus one that's existing the way that your tire services will play a factor too they'll always be trenched but how you actually get them into the dwelling will matter right no matter what the project is for a potential adu please 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 consider this because in both scenarios you must have the services there the goal is to have a self-contained unit yeah. Right. So essentially what we're doing is building a small house in someone's backyard or in your backyard. 
but with the idea of the services underground, which you won't be able to see after the fact, it's back to the original dwelling. One final comment I want to make here. This is not a lot of space, right? This did not take, you know, we didn't need some huge setback from the road. We didn't need some huge uh, planning consideration from all that perspective. Like you guys obviously made this work with what looks like maybe three, three and a half feet here. So, you know, we're talking about using the existing structure that's here and using the existing land. We're not, you know, toppling the neighbor's house over to get new services out to the back. Yeah, and I can give you kind of like the the uh, the specs of a trench, if you will, but I'll take a quick step back and planning. We, we love using that word, but there's so much that goes into it beyond your budget, right? Everyone's obsessed with numbers as you should be. But before that is getting that true formal technical game plan, We've briefly touched on it, aside from zoning and your bylaw checks and making sure that we're allowed to do the project we are desiring to do, beyond that, the building code and then actually putting the package together. So those, those proposed drawings we talked about, but even within those drawings, there's an HVAC design, HVAC plan. There's some sort of OLS that has to go in there, which is an Ontario land survey, right? Which have a combination of your lot lines, the topo, some pinning that helps with construction. Uh, beyond that, a grading plan. And there's many, many more items that go into this package. So once you put them all together, that's your true planning process, okay? So that comes after your real estate agent, your mortgage, and kind of doing the due diligence checks on that side, okay? And then the life of a trench, let's call it, depending on the service we're talking about, any water service, so your sewer lines and your and your water lines are always a little bit deeper, somewhere between four to six feet, depending on the slope and the trenching. And then for our power, we're only about two feet down. And then same thing for our gas line and keeping all these kind of staggered and, and separate. We're fortunate enough in this three foot space, we're able to get all of them in there. Where we're fortunate is my guys doing it with shovels because we can't get <laughs> machines here. Yeah, that, that, that is an unfortunate reality. But hey, we're working with what we got here. Guys, if you guys enjoyed this video, we're going to be making 10 more. We're going to be visiting way more sites, way more different styles. And I'm really excited to show you the other types of ADUs that we have available. So far, we've covered the retro. This is the new build in the backyard. We have a couple more coming. We you're do. You have to stay tuned, and I'm not even telling you about them. What I am going to tell you is the next video you're going to see coming out from us is all about the planning. It's all about the red tape and the things that you're probably starting to have questions about from seeing these last two videos. I look forward to seeing you guys there, and I'll be right back with Yasser and Triple Five. Yasser, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, guys.